going around this great country. So for me to shut up and for, murder, for her to come on. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Kitty Worthman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your great state of New Jersey. I was born in Austria, and I lived there seven years under Hitler's brutal regime. And after World War II, three years under Soviet communist occupation. In 1938, the media reported that Hitler rolled into Austria with tanks and guns and took us over. Not true at all. The Austrian people elected Hitler by 98% of the vote by means of the ballot box. Now, you might ask, how could a Christian nation almost 100% Catholic, to elect a monster like Hitler. The truth is, at the beginning, Hitler didn't look like or talk like a monster at all. He talked like an American politician. In 1938, Austria was in a very deep depression. We had one-third of our workforce unemployed. We had 25% inflation. And if you would borrow money from the bank, you pay 25% interest. It was not unusual that my mother would feed on the average 30 people a day a bowl of soup and a slice of bread. People would come knocking on the door. They wanted to work. There were no jobs. The depression was so bad that we had riots in the streets. There were two political factions fighting each other. Communist Party was getting very powerful. So was the Nazi party. Now, when I speak of the Nazi party, the, actually, the Nazi party, what we, are, what we are going to be in our country, the National Socialist Party. I translate national socialism. That's where the word Nazi came from. So, we heard Hitler speaking in Germany. Germany had full employment. They had law and order, and we had riots in the street. And in Germany, the people had a high living standard. They all drove the little Volkswagen, you know, the Beetle car. And there was nothing ever said that anybody was being persecuted. So when we had that unbelievable unemployment and the people were getting so desperate, they petitioned the government for a plebiscite for an election. And that's when we elected Hitler by 98% of the vote by means of the ballot box. So we got a new government, National Socialism. Nazi government. Of course, we had no idea what that would all be. We just thought we were all going to live a high standard of living like Germany. And Hitler promised us that within weeks we would have full employment. And he would feed the poor people. The Red Cross came in. Everybody was being fed. Everybody got something. And, and we were so grateful for everything, oh, we, we thought Hitler was our savior. Oh, yes, he was a very good orator. He gave very good speeches, and we heard that here, too, haven't we? So, when we got the new government, 
Nobody was elected anymore. Everybody was appointed. From the school board, the county commission, the city commission, to the legislature, and to the governors. And Hitler said, the best people are being appointed. We only pick, pick the best people, and we trusted him. So we had no more elections, none whatsoever. We also had regionalism. Regionalism is to centralize the government. Centralization is socialism. So Hitler said we have to merge our seven states into four. That will save money. And we only would have four governors. We thought that's a good idea. As a lobbyist in South Dakota, I found a bill three times, three times, to consolidate our 66 counties into 15. That's centralization. That's socialism. Take away local control. That's socialism. So with our new government, we got a lot of new laws. We got a very, very good law, we thought, the Equal Rights Amendment. Well, equal rights for women. Haven't we heard that here, too? So the Equal Rights Amendment had two components, economically and socially. Economically, to redistribute the wealth of the country. And then, socially, to get all the women, the moms, out into the workforce, into employment. Oh yes, Hitler got a lot of jobs, a lot of jobs, political appointments, hundreds and hundreds of bureaucrats, and of course he built the Autobahn, the freeway. So the moms were out into the workforce. What do you think would happen to the children? The government had immediately a remedy, child care centers. So the state raised our children. And by economically to redistributing the wealth, we had massive, massive welfare. Because we had a guaranteed income, the government decried that everybody has to be equal, have an equal income. Those who worked hard paid 70% taxes, and those who were down here, they were getting the equal income like those who worked hard. That's called socialism. Also, education was nationalized very quickly, literally overnight. I was 12 years old. I was in sixth grade. I walked into my classroom. I went to public school. We had an excellent school system. We prayed in public school. And we also had religious education twice a week. That all stopped overnight. I walked into my classroom March 13, 1938. The crucifix was gone. And there was Hitler's picture with the Nazi flag on each side. And our teacher said, today we don't pray anymore. We sing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles, the national anthem. And she said, we don't have religious education anymore either. We have physical education instead. And on Sundays, there would be National Youth Day. And that would be compulsory. Everybody had to attend. And if our parents wouldn't send us the first time, they would get a very stiff letter of warning. Second time, they would have to pay a fine of the equivalent of $300 and the third time we didn't attend was jail for our parents. Well, we couldn't go to church anymore. The first two hours we had political in education. Today, I call it political indoctrination. We were being told not to listen to our parents. They were old-fashioned, old fogies, didn't understand the youth, only Hitler did. So we were being totally indoctrinated. And the rest of the day we had sports. 
We got all the equipment free. We got tennis rackets. We got golf clubs. And the boys of age 16, they got motorcycles so they could form a motorcycle squad. Not only that, they were taken out to the airfield to fly gliders. You can imagine that the end of the day we went back home and told our parents how wonderful Hitler was, what he was doing for us, and how great everything was. And of course, we all were compulsory, had to attend the Hitler Youth, that was compulsory. We argued with our parents all the time. We said, look, you don't know anything. You are old-fashioned. You don't understand us. They put a wedge between us and our parents. So my good mother, when my next school term came around, she uh, announced that she would take me out of this horrible public school she would enroll me in a private school with an excellent curriculum, but no fun. And I thought, this is terrible. But she packed me off. And as we had arrived at that big school with an eight-foot wall around and a locked iron gate, I bid my mother goodbye. I almost hated her. She was a wise woman. She said, Someday, when you grow up, you will realize what I'm doing for you. Needless to say, if my mother wouldn't have in the, uh, not done that, today I would be a radical Marxist. On holidays, I would go back home and visit my friends. I did not like what I saw. Girls of age 16 were pregnant to have babies for Hitler. Oh, Hitler wanted lots of babies. He knew what he all had in mind. And all this, you know, the lifestyle was very, very, very loose, you know. I did not like, so that was the educational system. It was literally education was nationalized. Hitler also gave us free radios. And then he nationalized our radio station. And we were told that <clears throat> if you listen to a foreign radio station, there's capital punishment. You don't turn on Switzerland or BBC. We only had one voice, the government. They ran the radio station. The newspaper was being censored before it hit the street. Hitler also looted the Jewish banks, and then he nationalized our banks. Then he nationalized our only car industry. Austria produced a little car, a little bit bigger than a Fiat. Hitler said, we don't need a Fiat. <clears throat> we have the Volkswagen. So everything was being nationalized. <clears throat> he also nationalized our health care system. We had, before Hitler, an excellent health care system, privately insured. We had good doctors. We had good hospitals. We had a lot of good research. That all stopped. It was free for everybody. Now. I remember my brother-in-law was a family physician. He told me that when he would go to his office in the morning at 8 o'clock, 40 patients were waiting for him to be cared for. People went to the doctor for everything and anything. And my brother-in-law said it was like practicing medicine on a conveyor belt. He could not take enough time for each patient because he was totally government controlled. The government took away free enterprise, salaried the doctors in the hospitals, and many, many doctors left the country because if you would, uh, uh, if you would need elective surgery, not um, 
emergency. You waited 18 months for a hospital bed. So many doctors left the country, including my own husband. He would not want to practice medicine like his brother had to. And when he came to the United States, he marveled how wonderful our health care is, how wonderful our research is, and how wonderful our hospitals, how modern they were. He said, I hope it never will end up in socialized medicine. Also, we had many government agencies, you know, the bureaucrats. The bureaucrats were writing all the rules and all the regulation. That's socialism. The unelected bureaucrats, and a lot of it applied to the farmers. The bureaucrats would go out on the farm and measure their land, told the farmers what to plant and how much he had to harvest. They also counted their livestock, how much they had to, since our food was being rationed, had to turn into the government. God help every farmer if they butchered the pig for themselves. He sure would go to jail. They also sent out the bureaucrats to count the chickens and ordered the chickens how many eggs they had to lay. That's socialism. Hitler wrote a book, My Struggle, Mein Kampf, but very few people read it. Had we read it, we would have known what was coming, but the people were so busy with sports, that was everything. Athletic events were everything, but people did not read. They did not read his book. We also had abortions, of course, were highly illegal. Hitler wanted a lot of babies, but if both parents were not 100% Aryan, you know the master race, the mother, if she was pregnant, she was selected to have an abortion. Can you imagine to force you to have an abortion? That was absolutely horrible. We also had euthanasia. And I was an eyewitness to that. In my last year of college, I was sent to a small village in the Austrian Alps. You know, that village was very isolated by mountains. And in the winter time, the mountain passes were closed because of snow. And in that village, the people would intermarry. And we know by genetics that a lot of offsprings were mentally handicapped. And in that village, there were 15 of them. One I know very well, Vincent, our janitor. He could not speak very well. He could not read and write. But all these people, they did good manual work. So one day, the uh, health department came to the families and asked them if they would want to send their son or daughter to an institution to learn how to read and write and maybe learn a trade like basket weaving. Gladly the parents signed the papers. Off they went. I remember that morning, I looked out of my classroom window and I saw Vincent and all these people going into the health department van and they were taken away. And I thought they were going for an outing, but my, I asked my principal and he said, no, they're going into an institution to learn how to read and write. And I said, oh, that's wonderful. Six months passed. The letters came back to the parents that they died a natural but merciful death. They all were in excellent health when they left. Why should they die within six months? It dawned on us, and the news traveled very fast in the village that they were being euthanized. We also had a federal police force, commonly known as the Gestapo, and they were everywhere, everywhere, in civilian clothes. You didn't know who they were.
but it went like this since our food was all rationed and somebody in your family passed away like grandma so you quickly took that coveted pound of sugar and went to the grocery store and got that pound of sugar and then the next day the Gestapo would knock on your door and they said we know you bought that pound of sugar instead of turning in the coupon by law but you have to inform on your neighbor, your boss, your friends, everybody you know. And you come to our office once a week. But if you don't do that, then we will arrest you. That way they had a network of informers. We didn't trust the mailman. We couldn't trust anybody who came to our house. And when we talked something politically in our family, we only whispered. So that was the informants, the Gestapo, and they were everybody. And we were deadly scared of the Gestapo because people disappeared all the time. We also had gun registration. Oh, the Austrian people had all, they all had guns. But the government said the guns are very dangerous. Children are playing with guns, hunting accidents happen, and we really have to have total control, safety. And we had criminals again. And the only way that we can trace the criminal was by the serial number of the gun. So we dutifully went to the police station and we registered our guns. Not long after, they said, no, it didn't help. The only way that we don't have accidents and crimes, you bring the guns to the police station and then we don't have any crimes anymore and any accidents. And if you don't do that, capital punishment. So that's what we did. <clears throat> Hitler also nationalized our churches. He said those beautiful cathedrals need a lot of upkeep and restoration and there's not enough money coming in by private donation on Sunday. <clears throat> so we have to have a church tax. So when they pay their income tax, you pay 2% church tax. That way, Hitler could control the churches. No pastor could speak out anymore. So dictatorship didn't happen overnight. It took five years, gradually, little by little, to escalate up to a dictatorship. And, and of course with the Gestapo, and I also should relate to you, it was probably last year in, in February in 2009, I drove to the Capitol one morning as a lobbyist, turned on the radio, and I heard President Obama say, anybody who is criticizing him reported to the White House the snitch program. So be careful what you say. <clears throat> Our borders were being closed. Nobody could get in and nobody could get out. We were sitting ducks. That's what happened to us. Also, I had the opportunity in November 1985 to go to Switzerland to the summit conference between President Reagan and Premier Gorbachev. I was to accommodate the American women who went over there to support President Reagan. My other mission was to infiltrate the Communist Peace March. And I came in disguise as a horrible looking hippie I marched with Bella Epsuk, the congresswoman, the late congresswoman, Jesse Jackson, and Barbara Boxer. And as we arrived at the Hotel Hilton for the press conference, I saw a group of people there who were not at the peace march. And I walked up to a woman and I said, how come you were not at the peace march? And she said, well, we are all members of the German Communist Party and we couldn't get legally into Switzerland so we went over the mountains. Hence 
all their muddy boots and torn jackets. So I said, well, tell me more about what is the occasion, what you are doing here. Well, first of all, she said, we are supporting Premier Gorbachev. And I said, well, that's also interesting. Tell me more. What are your real goals? So she said, well, right now we take Nicaragua and Honduras, then we go into Mexico. And I said, why Mexico, such a poor, corrupt country? She said, that is our major goal. I said, why? To take back the territory what America stole from us, California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. And I said, look, you cannot do this. You need a lot of people. It sounds to me like a revolution. She said, you American are so naive. Your churches are doing the work for us. And it hit me like a ton of bricks, the sanctuary movement. There are a lot of churches who are bringing in the illegals. So I said to her, tell me, when is this event supposed to happen? She said, that all depends who your president is. Maybe 2004, but most possible 2008. Who is our president? And look what's happening at the border. When I saw on television in Los Angeles when they marched, they trampled, they carried the Mexican flag and they trampled on the American flag. It dawned on me, they're here. When the people fear the government, that's tyranny. But when the government fears the people, that's you, the Tea Party, that's liberty. <clears throat> Keep your guns. Keep your guns and buy more guns. America is still a Christian nation, no matter what Obama says. I am an optimist. God is still on the throne. He did. Thank you. He did not fail us in Austria when the Americans liberated us, and he will save America. Amen. We have to take our country back as we know it. We have to take the U.S. Senate back. We have to take the White House back. My speech is out there and it's designed as a house party that you buy your C my CD and invite five or six people to your home and play the CD. We did that in South Dakota. We elected a very conservative congresswoman. I went to Minnesota. We elected uh, Michelle Bachmann. And, and we defeated a very liberal Democrat in Minnesota <clears throat> who was in for 18 years. And I am speaking all over the United States, everywhere, this year, last year, and next year. We have to take America back as we know it. Those of us who sailed past the Statue of Liberty we came to a country of unbelievable freedom and opportunity. America is the greatest country in the world, if we can keep it. God bless America, and God bless you. I want to thank each and every one of you for coming out today. I remind you, please, it's urgent that you spread the word. Let people know what this movement is about. Let them know that... Uh, there is hope in this country. Also want to uh, thank Project Shining City for videography today. Thank you very much.
going around this great country. So for me to shut up and for, murder, for her to come on. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Kitty Worthman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to your great state of New Jersey. I was born in Austria, and I lived there seven years under Hitler's brutal regime. And after World War II, three years under the Soviet communist occupation. In 1938, the media reported that Hitler rolled into Austria with tanks and guns and took us over. Not true at all. The Austrian people elected Hitler by 98% of the vote by means of the ballot box. Now, you might ask, how could a Christian nation almost 100% Catholic, to elect a monster like Hitler. The truth is, at the beginning, Hitler didn't look like or talk like a monster at all. He talked like an American politician. In 1938, Austria was in a very deep depression. We had one-third of our workforce unemployed. We had 25% inflation. And if you would borrow money from the bank, you pay 25% interest. It was not unusual that my mother would feed on the average 30 people a day street. And in Germany, the people had a high living standard. They all drove the little Volkswagen, you know, the Beetle car. And there was nothing ever said that anybody was being persecuted. So when we had that unbelievable unemployment, and the people were getting so desperate, they petitioned the government for a plebiscite for a election. And that's when we elected Hitler by 98% of the vote by means of the ballot box. So we got a new government, National Socialism, Nazi government. Of course, we had no idea what that would all be. We just thought we were all going to live a high standard of living like Germany. And Hitler promised us that within weeks we would have full employment. And he would feed the poor people eh, a bowl of soup and a slice of bread. People would come knocking on the door. They wanted to work. There were no jobs. The depression was so bad that we had riots in the streets. There were two political factions fighting each other. Communist Party was getting very powerful. So was the Nazi Party. Now, when I speak of the Nazi Party, the actually, the Nazi Party, what we are, what we are going to be in our country, the National Socialist Party. I translate National Socialism. That's where the word Nazi came from. So we heard Hitler speaking in Germany. Germany had full employment. They had law and order. And we had riots in the, the Red Cross came in. Everybody was being fed. Everybody got something. And, and we were so grateful for everything. Oh, we, we thought Hitler was our savior. Oh, yes, he was a very good orator. He gave very good speeches, and we heard that here too, haven't we? So when we got the new government, 
Nobody was elected anymore. Everybody was appointed. From the school board, the county commission, the city commission, to the legislature, and to the governors. And Hitler said, the best people are being appointed. We only pick, pick the best people, and we trusted him. So we had no more elections, none whatsoever. We also had regionalism. Regionalism is to centralize the government.